This is Radio Broccoli. Radio Broccoli has been entertaining patients of the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital for 50 years now. The reason it's been here all that time? Hundreds of volunteers giving up days, weeks and months of their free time. I'm Molly Townsend. In this five-week series, we'll hear the story of Radio Broccoli from some of the people who helped run it over all those years. We'll hear how it started in an old air raid shelter for a couple of hours once a week and how it's gone on to be the UK's hospital radio station of the year for 2016, broadcasting shows 24 hours a day. Today, in part two of our story, we look back at the early years of Radio Broccoli and hear from some of the founder members who tell us about some of the early shows. We'll hear from Mike Solomons, Ian Downs, Mike Shelton and Barry Cobden. This is the story of Radio Broccoli. Radio Broccoli, I'm very pleased to say, is the longest continuously running hospital radio station in London. However, it's not the oldest hospital radio station around by any means. And had Radio Edgware continued, for example, then it probably would have been one of the longest running, if not the longest running. Uh, the history with Radio Northwick Park was that um, before Len Elman uh, took over the running of Radio Edgware, he, as an experiment, wanted to run a hospital radio station himself and set up Radio Harrow at the Harrow General Hospital, which was replaced by Northwick Park Hospital. Naturally, he transferred the radio station to Northwick Park Hospital. Radio Broccoli had launched on the 2nd of October 1966 and gradually more members came in. So how did people apply to the programmes in the early days? We would get a situation where one person or a group of people would want to do something that had never been done before. Bingo being an example. Um, Tuesday night programmes being an example. A person or a group of people would come to us leaders and say they wanted to do whatever it was and we'd explain why it couldn't possibly be done and they would argue and as long as they argued long enough and they thought it through carefully we would reluctantly let them do it and then wow we got bingo wow we've got a program on Tuesday night and so on and so forth um, I have to apologize to all the people we tricked but uh, it was a very good technique by having to fight for it the personal group um, had to indicate they were serious uh, and, and then, of course, they had to prove that they were not just serious, but they were going to make a go of it. And oddly, I can't recall any occasion where a person or group of people forced, this, forced the issue and then fell flat in their faces. They succeeded. I think everybody had their idea of what they wanted to do. There was no real guidance, and I think we just sort of tried to... It was music that buzzed us along... And then, of course, you suddenly realise it's not just about the music, it's about communicating with patients and what are the patients getting out of it. And uh, the most important thing, actually, was knocking on the door and going to talk to patients. And it was that social interface that uh, helped them and then they could hear the music and uh, the bingo came along. And that, that's it's all about people. One of Radio Broccoli's members at that time was a young lady called Jelaine Painter, who was, I think, originally one of the girlfriends of one of our members, but became a nurse in this hospital and subsequently qualified as a nurse at Northwick Park Hospital and was a very active and enthusiastic member of Radio Broccoli. Now, she either invented or heard about, and I can't say which, Bedside Bingo, which was a new activity for Radio Broccoli. I don't think it was a new activity in hospital radio generally. And uh, we came up, she came up with this scheme whereby you could go out and buy a book of bingo slips and take them round the ward and ask people to join in, which a lot of people, were, I'm pleased to say, were happy to do so. It gave us an opportunity, again, to go out and visit people in the wards. We didn't charge, although we did invite a donation and people would put two and a half P, so the old sixpence, 
in for each ticket that they bought. Some people would buy one ticket, some people would buy five because there were five on a page. And we would call out the numbers exactly the same way that Dave Rouch does now. It was already going, it had just been going when I started here. And the first programme that I did was a comedy record programme because I had rather a lot of them. I've still got a lot of them and they sound very dated now. But uh, after that was bingo and the configuration of the wards was a little different. And I do remember that I used to always be on Ward 8. I, I just remember that. They've probably all got names now. But Ward 8, which is up the slope and on the right. Um, and then somebody else always used to grab Duke of Gloucester Ward. I, is that still there? It's still there. Good Lord. Um, and it was great fun. But just as much fun was the cable bashing because we actually had pickup points off the old air raid shelter. And we used to have to plug in there and then un unspool the cable, run up the slope run to everywhere because it's all extremely cable orientated and as time went by we got pick up points further up the slope so it was much easier to plug in but the cable bashing was still um it was right program finished cable bashing and we used to roll up <laughs> and i can't remember who was doing the bingo before me but that person was wanted to stand down so i put my hand up and said i can do that <laughs> and uh that was agreed, and uh, here I am, uh, 29 years later. <laughs> Next year will be the 30th anniversary. One of the things that we did, which I remembered while I was talking just now, we, I think, carried out one of the very first live telephone links. This was before uh, you were allowed to make a connection to a telephone for any purpose at all, or to a telephone line. Um, it might have been possible to use extremely expensive link equipment, but for hospital radio it was impossible. So what we did was we created a two-way arrangement, an amplifier fed to a coil of wire which was wrapped round the microphone of the um, a coin box phone that was near the studio and a second coil of wire was wrapped around the earpiece to pick up the sounds from the earpiece and one of our we did two things we did um, we, we, we ran programs which were two-way with what was then called Radio Wembley and we also had a number of live links with relatives of patients I'm sure it's done much better today, <laughs> but it worked. And we, I think, were one of the first people to do it. In 1967, the M1, which was the first motorway in the UK uh, and had been built between Boreham Wood, or just roughly the north side of Brockley Hill, up towards Birmingham in the general direction of Birmingham, although it didn't go that far. It was a major success so far as road users were concerned and as everybody knows we now have a major motorway network in the UK. Radio Broccoli never saw itself as being entirely local although we had local activities uh, we also had patients who came from all over the country and for that reason alone we considered ourselves to be a hospital with a national footprint although we didn't actually do things in Hartlepool or Edinburgh but we felt that we actually had a, um, links to other parts of the country so when it was decided and it was publicly announced that the M1 which by that time had become very successful was going to be extended south from roughly Boreham Wood to Edgware it was a major national news story and we were right on the doorstep and we thought, well, we'll have a go at this. We'll see if we can actually participate in the opening ceremony. The M1 extension, um, gosh, we went along with a portable tape recorder made by EMI, and we had our microphone alongside the uh, PA system microphone. No 
TV or radio press there in those days. It would have been just the local paper, maybe a national paper, literally taking photographs and um, and uh, writing down what the what the person cutting the ribbon actually said. And we then drove down this new section of motorway in a sort of almost a cavalcade of cars, and then came all the way back up again to Watford. And uh, we, as we went along, did a commentary on this wonderful new piece of road, which was, I suppose, innovative at the time because the motorways had only been really open since about 1959. And it was uh, 10 years later, there were virtually no real motorways in the UK. There weren't many of them anyway. And they certainly didn't, weren't very sophisticated. The uh, central reservation com comprised of just a strip of grass about six foot across and um, with no central barriers at all. So if your car decided to go AWOL or you fell asleep, you went across the other side and potentially could cause um, quite horrendous accidents. I, by this time, had learned to drive, so there are all these big black limousines, and my mum's little green Austin A40 with me at the wheel joining in this motorcade. I can't remember whether it was to or from the opening ceremony, but at the opening ceremony we put a microphone up on a stand with a big sign that said Radio Broccoli, uh, and the uh, MP concerned um, opened, declared open this extension to the motorway, and we drove down it. And Mike Solomon sat next to me with this little tape recorder and recorded his commentary about what he could see and what was going on, motorcade, VIPs, that sort of stuff. And then we brought it back here, edited it very rapidly, and transmitted it, well, it wasn't quite the same day, but very, very quickly soon after. Well, of course, radio stations up and down the country and all the way around the world do this sort of thing every day nowadays. But for us, this was exciting, interesting, and stretched our technology and our capabilities. And it was really quite a useful lesson. It's probably the only time that I was ever going to drive without seat belts, they weren't legal requirements then, at about 20 miles an hour on an uncrowded motorway, uh, and um, well, generally we were messing about. It was great fun, but we did put a programme together as well. 1969 was the year that a very young Peter Young made his debut on Radio Broccoli. Peter Young was a, a very enthusiastic um, DJ, um, presenter at the time but obviously like all was very new to it all but he was very keen to move on and to learn from the experience but of course the benefit he gave was that his his growing experience then benefited the radio station and of course at the end of the day the patients as well and this is almost London's longest running DJ here not quite but I certainly feel my age today good afternoon this is Peter Young and what about this for a turn up for the books? Back on Radio Broccoli, I'll tell you how it all started. I came along to Radio Broccoli in 1969 with a friend of mine who was actually working on the station. I was just to keeping him company. And suddenly he put me on the air. I couldn't believe it. He just threw me on the air and I did 20 minutes on Radio Broccoli in 1969. And this is the first time they've invited me back since. And you can't really blame them, can you? By then, Radio Broccoli had moved to its second home, another air raid shelter. The, uh, the, the new home for Radio Broccoli was up the slope, and it was uh, an air raid shelter which seemed to have less leaks than the first air raid shelter, and it served, and we spent, a time, spent some time and energy in uh, doing some work on the acoustics, and yes, it became the home of quite some years. Yeah, somebody found that one of these air raid shelters uh, between Hut 2 and Hut 3, Ward 2 and Ward 3, was available. It was about 100 feet as the crow flies from the first one. And it had just some old wheelchairs and some old bedsteads in being stored in it. So we got permission to move Radio Broccoli into that new, drier, warmer uh, air raid shelter. I can vaguely picture air raid shelter number two, dingy and damp and cold, um, but we had space uh, and uh, that did help greatly. Uh, I don't think that the original studio here was much bigger than the um, 
uh, air raid shelter number two, but it was more secure, it was warm, it was dry. And dry was the key thing we were looking for. So we moved the equipment pretty much as it was in the Hut 1 air raid shelter, and Ian ran a cable from the hospital's radio distribution system, which stayed next door to Hut 1, in its own dry little end of its own wet little <laughs> air raid shelter. And we ran a cable to the, um, to the new site, uh, where we stayed for a, a good two or three years, I think three or four years. And it was much more successful because it would stay dry. It wouldn't stay very warm. There was no heating in it, as, unless, as we said, we left the, uh, the heater on. I don't think we had to leave the heater on all winter in that room. We just switched it on when we came up to begin our activities on a Sunday evening, and it warmed the place up for us, and it was quite pleasant to work in there. We hung some curtains around the walls to break it. Uh, or oh, we'd hung curtains around the walls in the original area shelter, but they went mouldy because of the damp. So they didn't last very long. In the new place, we could actually do what euphemistically you would call a, um, acoustic treatment, which was to hang some curtains around the walls. And uh, we put egg boxes behind the curtains, which was actually quite a good way of, 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 of treating a room for uh, acoustics. And it stayed useful for three or four years. And we continued our activities and we, we started very tentative moves towards taking a microphone out into the wards. We were, at that time, exactly right in between hut two and hut three, so a fairly short microphone cable would enable you to go into one of two huts and interview patients and do what we would call an outside broadcast. Outside broadcast, very grand term, piece, two pieces of wire. But what we would do uh, was to literally to run ca uh, uh, microphone cables over the roof of the uh, the long slope. Um, we were limited really to the slope, although we did go over to the um, children's wards at that time, I think as well at one point. Um, but literally, there were cables run up over the roof of the slope and then dropped down into a window of the ward and the sisters of the wards were just very, very good to us. Um, and there'd be wires trailing down the ward, but they didn't mind. They just let us get on with it and uh, the patients had fun and that to them was most, most important. We started developing the techniques of taking the microphone out, actually speaking in real life to real patients, real listeners, real consumers which was a technique that one had to develop, and it was a bit nerve-wracking to begin with, but one felt a little better as time went by. I did quite a lot of it. Mike Solomons did quite a lot of it. He was fairly self-confident. And gradually, 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 we used to do, we did that. It was fairly simple in the early days, you know, just, if you like, mounting the request show from the ward. We didn't specify how close the ward was to the studio, but somebody who had requested piece of music could actually read their own request out live on air and then we'd play the music and and in these days of the internet and uh, internet radio it's perhaps not recognized the fact that to take a microphone any great distance is itself uh, presents certain technical challenges and the person doing the speaking whether it be a patient or a presenter also has to have a pair of headphones so that he or she can know what's going on in the studio and there's certain technologies involved in that which we didn't know very much about we developed the techniques we were doing an interward quiz between i think wards three and six four and six do you know i can't remember after during the program there were supposed to be quiz questions asked of each patient in turn and they were supposed to give an answer themselves without any help or hint from the rest of the ward. It was a men's ward versus a women's ward and the each patient would have one question and so on and so forth. Well, they cheated. What do you expect? Voices from the other end of the ward yelling the answer, all sorts of things. And there was much laughter, and especially when uh, 
the ward I was in wasn't broadcasting. There was everything from how couldn't you not how could you not know that and uh, yes you should have said so and so and much banter and much chat as you'd imagine. Um, after when we were clearing everything up, a student nurse walked up to me and she said, "I think you're wonderful." Well, of course, naturally I was inclined to agree. She said, "I've been working on this ward for six months. Nobody talks." They don't have visitors. It's mostly silent. No conversation, no smiles, no laughter. And this evening they've been smiling, they've been laughing, they've been yelling to each other from one end of the ward to the other. They've all had a wonderful time. I think you're wonderful. And that's when I realised how important hospital radio is. All those years we've been just doing it for fun and then we realised it actually has an important side. Radio Broccoli then finally moved to its third and final home, as Barry Cobden explains. It was a very interesting sequence of events in the early 70s. This building where Radio Broccoli is now housed was, and this may offend the sensibilities of some people, but this building was a cat house. And they kept and under humane conditions, they kept cats and animals on which they were experimenting. That activity ceased, and we became aware that this building wasn't being used. So, I don't know who it belongs to. I don't know if it belonged to the Medical Research Council, or whether it belongs to the hospital, but we got permission to move into here. There are four rooms, more rooms about the size of the average living room in this building. And at that time, we got one of them. And the other three were being turned over to being used by other activities within the hospital. Subsequently, we got a second room, which is why we've now got the control room and studio arrangement that if you visit the studio, you can see. So that was uh, about 1970. It was, I can tell you exactly when it was, it was the second anniversary, and that was 1968, and it was in October, and we were here, and then I think for some reason we had to move back to one of the air raid shelters when they were doing some work to reconfigure the building we're in now, and then we moved back here, and I think that was 71. The chap who worked here as a technician for the Medical Research Council, a chap by the name of Peter Matthews, he became a Radio Broccoli volunteer, and it was he who pointed out that this building was, was going to or possibly was going to become available. So we moved in here. Now, the geography of this is such that previously the two studios we had had were on the slope, adjacent to the slope boards, close enough to the activities close enough to the radio distribution system and close enough for us to experiment with outside broadcast activities from the hospital wards. This building is located about 50 yards further down the hill that is Broccoli Hill within the hospital grounds and was going vacant and we managed to persuade the hospital to let us have one of the rooms, literally two. Fantastic. When we moved into the building that Radio Broccoli now is. In fact, we had more room than you had now. The floor sloped, that was it. And that was interesting, and especially when you try and set tables up on something that wasn't level. Um, but again, it was quite crude. It was the, the egg box mentality for um, sound absorption, which didn't really work. Um, but it allowed us to expand our record collection and, and it just made us become more professional in a sense because we had a proper permanent setup in a space that was dry and allowed for pre-production, um, which wasn't easy in the earlier days. So then we ended up in this building, initially in one of the rooms, subsequently in two. Nice, warm, dry. Uh, we put up the uh, acoustic treatment on the walls, which is... Um, under felt stapled to the walls and then covered in hardboard with holes in it called pegboard and the acoustics were good we put up we didn't exactly have air conditioning but there is an extractor fan in the roof so you can draw 
outside air through the rooms and expend it, expel it out through the lo roof. Um, quite a nice home for the equipment. We also built a new mixer, which is the central operational part of any radio station. That has subsequently been replaced as well. When we moved down here, we'd grown in numbers, so fortunately that um, need was spread. And obviously we had tape recorders, turntables, um, and it, everything got more elaborate as we let, went, uh, went along, and it meant that we could be more professional when the output and we were recording interviews off the wards um, almost like a new news items um, so it, it meant that we were progressing as a very proper radio station stood in the amount of um, input it had from the point of recording material we didn't have any uh, computer screens because we didn't have a computer we had one phone line uh, ooh, 954 6591 Oh, God, there's a memory. Is that still the, f the same, same number? Good grief. Um, which was handy because... And, and there was an internal phone as well. And if we would, if somebody got a full house on bingo, we had to rush to the phone in the nurse's office and dial the internal number. 183 or something? 483. Now, that, come on. This is many years on. And uh, it, we had two decks which got upgraded and upgraded to the decks which we have now. Um, which came out of, uh, I think they came out of uh, the London television studios down at Wembley. Uh, we had a Studer tape recorder, which came out of the BBC, I think. We also got at one stage a portable Studer to do interviews with, and I remember in the 70s I got the chance to interview the entire original cast of Side by Side by Sondheim. So I went to Wyndham's Theatre with the trusty Studer and, and did some interviews before anybody realised what a smash hit show it was. Um, and we also had a couple of people who used to come down and, and help out. There was a chap called Sim Hill and Sim seemed to have a plethora of professional quality recording equipment. I don't know why and I don't know how. I, how and we used to go and record the National Youth Jazz Orchestra doing gigs for example we used to invite folk singers uh, to we actually did them at Northwick Park so we could get hold of a room at Northwick Park which is big enough for a folk group to play in and we used to record them and they'd be exclusive sessions just for us those tapes have probably all since disappeared but it's a crying shame but yeah I do remember that bit of equipment by the end of the 60s, Radio Broccoli was broadcasting for, I think it was three or four hours a night on a Sunday night, and one other night during the week. I think we did a couple of hours on a Wednesday. It meant that quite a lot of people who were either at college or working needed to come up here of an evening during the week, which wasn't as easy for people in those days as it might appear. So the move to a weekday evening was quite a major development as far as we were concerned at Radio Broccoli. But we were slowly expanding the number of hours broadcast. We were slowly expanding our membership. We were slowly expanding our record library. We were getting contributions from the patients for the bingo. We were getting contributions from the volunteers in the form of, well, we didn't actually have a membership fee, but people who were keen were happy to put in a few pence and it was only a few pence a week as a sort of membership contribution so the coffers were growing the whole thing came together in about 1971 and has been improved on on a couple of occasions since but the basis of the operation has remained here ever since on next week's program we'll look back on the 70s and the 80s from bed pushes in the end we got up to marble arch we were outside the cinema at Marble Arch in the traffic and obviously the car was looking at us rather than where we were going and drove into the car in front of it. It was a Rover 2000 as I recall and it uh, certainly burst its radiator. My guess is that the cost of that repair was probably more than we managed to collect on the day, although we did manage to collect a, a few hundred pounds. To Marathon Broadcasts. The idea was each presenter gathered sponsorship. He or she would do 24 hours straight. I think we raised something like um, £2,500, which in those days was a lot of money. 
The story of Radio Broccoli continues. <laughs>